Joining me today is an author, a professor, an evolutionary behavioral scientist, a man who wears a bow tie when speaking to the Canadian Parliament, and a guy with an incredible tan, Gad Sad. Welcome back to the Rubin Report. So nice to be back. Thanks, Dave. The tan. I don't know that our cameras, I don't know that YouTube, <laughs> through the wires and the tubes or whatever, gets it out to the people. I don't know that it can take that level of tan. They're, just you being next to me, you're going to get tan. I hope so, because I've never felt whiter <laughs> than I feel right now. That is that good Lebanese skin that you have. That is indeed. Uh, all right, so you've been on the show many times. Uh, you were my, my first, you were on the first test show right. of the Rubin Report. You were on the first panel we ever did. We've done one-on-ones a couple times. Uh, from getting to know you, you have just been in sort of what I would call the fight that is happening now, the free speech fight, the, the fight for enlightenment values, for liberal values, th this whole thing. Uh, but I thought a, a nice way to start would be, you happen to be on vacation right now. Right. You are in the midst of a, a five-week SoCal vacation. And how important is that when you are someone that puts yourself out there all the time? As I said, you just spoke to Canadian Parliament. You were at Google doing a talk. I mean, just as someone that's always out there, the shutdown, how important? It, it, very important. Although I am, I've done a few shows while I'm here, so there is a bit of work interspersed within the vacation. It's terribly important, not so much for going to the beach, but for disconnecting from being available to the public. Now, I always promise my wife that I will absolutely not check a single thing yeah. on social media. <laughs> but then usually that lasts three, four, five days, and then I succumb to the temptation. Uh, but that, I think, is fundamentally the most important part of my vacation, which is to not weigh in every hour on Twitter, to just disconnect. Yeah. And so profoundly important. How do you balance between the academic things that you care about and all the stuff that we're going to talk about for the, for the next hour or so, and just being human? Because I feel like that's what people are having trouble dealing with. And I, I mean that from people that work blue collar jobs to people that are doing high level math stuff. I feel like people are having trouble separating like just all the noise from reality. So I basically have, professionally speaking, I have really two hats that I wear. That of a professor with all that that entails which if I only did that, it would keep me busy 18 hours a day. And then there is my public intellectual hat that I wear. Uh, over the past few years, I feel that a, a large part of my time has been taken up by the latter. Mm -hmm. And now I'm trying to kind of rein that in. So to still remain a, a viable voice in the battle of public ideas, but I need to sort of go back to some of the fundamentals, the, the lab stuff. Not yeah. that I've ever given it, given it up, uh, but it takes time, as you know, right? To build an audience, to get people excited about what you have to say. It takes a lot of effort. And so I don't think I have the magical recipe yet, but I try to every day do a bit of both. Yeah, when you made that shift, which probably was right around when I met you, met whatever we did on Twitter, right. however you connect with right. someone on Twitter, uh, you know, whatever that is now, four years ago or so, when you made that sort of shift from academic to someone that was gonna speak their mind publicly and right. fight with people publicly and right. make videos and interviews and all that stuff, did you realize how much of a, a not, not just a time suck, but a, uh, a, an important piece of your life it was gonna become? I didn't. Uh, you know, I'm very much of a purist, so I'm just excited by things like a child, right? So yeah. I discovered that there's this thing called social media that allows me to advertise my ideas with all sorts of people, meet people that I would ever otherwise never meet, like Dave Rubin and countless others, even random strangers that I get to meet who send me beautiful gifts and I get to know them well, who tell me stuff that's personal in their lives. So I never thought that that would be possible, but I'm amazed at the power of the medium. Uh, and I don't say this in, in an arrogant manner, just walking down the street, and probably you get this probably 10 times more than I do, the number of people who recognize you, who come up to you, who say they love your work, who fall, you know, we could be on the beach and I'll be stopped. We could, <laughs> I could be in a bathroom and someone will say, hey, Godfather. And so that's- Nothing worse than that when you're peeing <laughs> and somebody, the guy next not. to you, it's like, come on. <laughs> uh, but that, I, I look at that with, with a bit of humility in that uh, it's incredible that we have these platforms, which five, 10 years ago, a guy like me in academia could have never hoped to have. And so it's been wonderful, it's been a blessing. Yeah, is there a real silver lining to everything that's going on now, which is people feel like everyone's dumber and fighting all the time. And you know, I'm a firm believer that most of us, 80% of us want the same simple things and to live decent lives and, and have some food and have some money and be able to go on vacation and have some sex and just whatever, whatever those basics are. Um, but the silver lining, while it sounds so crazy, 
that obviously if people are recognizing you and rewarding you for the work you do, it shows that there's an intellectual thirst Absolutely. these days. It's not being given to you by the mainstream media, but it shows that it's out there. Absolutely, and I mean shows like, like you, that are not mainstream, uh, I think eventually this will be the mainstream. Uh, it, it amazes me how the mainstream media has sort of doubled down, you know, to, to use a term that we might talk about later, ostrich logic, put the yeah. head in the sand and refuse to sort of recognize some of the dynamics. Uh, look, anything that promotes more discussion is great. I only wish that people were sometimes a bit nicer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? uh, I think but perhaps they haven't evolved <laughs> to be nicer? <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, That's, I mean, that should be your next book. Maybe that should be the next book. The evolution book. Uh, of evil oh. online. <laughs> I mean, I think we, we both most of the time do this, right? We're able to brush it off. But it takes a it takes a toll, you know. Yeah. Reading about your, in my case, my weight, my Judaism, my, I mean, it's just endless, you know, uh, nasty things that are written about you. Yeah. I wish people would recognize that both of us and many of us who play in this marketplace of idea are really doing it with pure, re pure reasons to contribute to a discussion. And uh, if people could learn to be a bit nicer, we would all be richer for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I wish it, <laughs> but I, I don't sense that coming down the right. pike. All right, so we're, we're gonna do a lot of stuff here, but I think just first, because it couches everything else, uh, on the free speech front, you've become one of the few people I, that I know of, at least on the public side in Canada, that are really fighting the free speech battle. Of course, the, the real high profile guy also is Jordan Peterson, uh, also at the academic level, of course. Um, what is happening in Canada right now? I mean, it, it, it seems pretty scary, actually, when you hear some of this stuff. Uh, Canada, I think, is desperately trying to become the number one uh, social justice warrior country in the world. It's trying to catch up to Germany and Sweden, in part because we have a prime minister who very much uh, epitomizes those positions. And so the endless tsunami of these types of positions are difficult to keep up with. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, I had appeared in front of the Canadian Senate to testify. Maybe I could mention this very briefly. Please. So there's a bill. Dad, you're here to tell me what you think. Uh, <laughs> you don't uh, even have to ask uh, me. Uh, bill C-16 is a bill that has now since passed. Both Jordan Peterson and I, on, in separate sessions, had been asked to appear uh, to discuss some of our concerns with the bill. The bill basically refers to incorporating gender identity and gender expression uh, within hate crime laws. Mm -hmm. That if you target someone based on their gender identity or gender expression, then it's hateful. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, I guess the, the, pen the penalty would be ratcheted up. Uh, and I appeared in front of the Canadian Senate to basically argue that the, the way that it was worded is so vague and potentially so dangerous that literally anything that I teach in my evolutionary psychology courses could be construed as, quote, transphobic systemic violence. Uh, and the reason why I say quotes, because th those are terms that a Harvard pamphlet, the LGBTQ office at Harvard had put out a pamphlet where they argued that people who support, uh, f quote, fixed binaries and biological essentialism, fixed binaries is male, female. It's male, female, yeah. Biological essentialism is arguing that there are, you know, biological realities, evolved realities, innate sex differences. If you promulgate these types of position, you are actually engaging in, quote, transphobic systemic violence. That's not, that's not allegorical, it's not metaphorical. You literally are being transphobically violent. And so I argue that anything that I say in my course, when I walk into my course and introduce the concept of sexual selection and how sex-specific traits evolve, mm -hmm. I, I only use words like male and female. I don't refer to the non-binary and non-gender and so on. So any person in the room could say, hey, in a 13-week course, you never once recognized my personhood. You're engaging in transphobic systemic violence. The answer to this very sober uh, presentation that I gave was that one of the Canadian senators accused me of being pro-genocide. And where did that come um, from? Because apparently the fact that I was not supporting the bill, somehow through a gargantuan <sighs> leap of logic, you know, I wanted to feather and tar our transgender people. And I, I specifically argued that all people deserve to be treated equally under the law, mm -hmm. but we don't have to uniquely celebrate your personhood, right? There's a distinction between treating you as an equal member of society and having to go an extra mile to uniquely celebrate your person. I'll give you another example. Yeah. Canada wanted to now create a gender neutral society. So the idea being that 
uh, the marker, male or female, say on official uh, government documents, should be removed because that small percentage, less than 1%, substantially less than 1%, who consider themselves non-gendered or non-binary are going to feel marginalized by having to write male or female. So 99.9% .9 of a population should lose an identifying marker <laughs> that is part of their personhood. I am a male. I have a child that's male, I have a, a daughter that's female, I'm married to a woman that's female. All of these things should be removed because someone might be marginalized by that biological reality. It's insanity. So for someone like you that, that deals in academia, but more importantly that deals in the realm of science and you have to base things on fact, this is actually a direct assault on you in a certain way, right? Like you're, in, like you're talking about something that's important societally, but really it's rational self-interest. You want to be able to do your job that you have been trained to do at the highest level without having outside fears. So when, when you finished up that talk over there, did you feel better or worse for the course of this? I felt better in that at least my positions were on record. I didn't have any uh, sense that the bill would be defeated. Uh, I, I felt very strongly that it would ultimately pass just because of the, the reality of the dynamics of the political system there. But at least I knew that Jordan had been heard, I had been heard, it's officially on record. Uh, so in that sense, I felt I had done my, quote, civic duty. Yeah. Uh, but I had no illusions that I, that I would help sway the vote. I knew that we would ultimately lose the battle. So when people say, I'll see online, sometimes people say, oh, you guys are overestimating when someone says racist or bigot or homophobe or Islamophobe or any of this stuff. This really goes to show why these are not, we're not just making up this fight. This fight, forget what people are saying online, this fight is now starting to codify things into law. Uh, absolutely, right? I mean, but never mind law. I mean, people say, well, you know, don't take these extreme examples. Well, you had Brett Weinstein on the show. I mean, is he not a real person who's experienced real death threats? So people always think that we're, in, in a sense, engaging in an exagger exaggerated narrative mm -hmm. by pointing to these extreme cases. But what is extreme today, tomorrow becomes mundane. And so this is why canaries in the coal mine stand up and sing and warn people, uh, but unfortunately, Apparently, people don't want to listen. Do you ever think that it's kind of it's kind of sucky to be someone that sees something a little bit early? I, I think it sometimes like it's it's great at a certain level, right? Because that's what makes people care about what you're saying because they have a they have a twinge of oh that guy's onto something. But like when I sat here with Brett and he at the time I don't know what he identifies as now, but at the time he was saying I'm a you know a, he said a deeply I think deeply committed progressive. Uh, I now know that he, at least, I don't want to speak for him, but basically has said, you know, the, the progressive train has left him. Right. Um, or, or he grew up. Or perhaps, I don't know that he would <laughs> say it so specifically, but, but I knew it. As I was sitting here with him and he was saying how he was this, this deep progressive, I knew that it was just a matter of a month or two months or whatever before he'd see the same, the thing that we've all been talking about for that long. So there's, it's, there's like a joy and also like a depression in that, I think. Well, my wife often tells me that I'm an avant-garde both in my scientific career and in my public <laughs> engagements. Uh, I think it's in part because I do see these trends early, but also because I have the courage to speak about them. You and I might both see them at the same time, but if I only have the courage to say it, then I appear as though I'm the avant-garde guy, whereas you saw the same pattern but were too afraid to say it. Yeah. And so in a sense, it's a unique combination of both seeing these patterns early enough, but then having the the, the courage to, to voice my opinion. And of course, that ultimately in academia is not something, contrary to what you might think, is not something that's desired. Herd mentality is really, as we say in French, de rigueur, it's the, it's the official way to be. Don't cause too much waves, uh, we don't want trouble here. Right, which is so the reverse of what true pursuit of knowledge is. So when people say that, I'll also hear that, well, you're, you guys are uh, overblowing what's happening on college campuses, or you're overblowing that there isn't enough diversity of thought there. As someone that's on college campuses, as someone that has uh, testified about what's happening there, and as someone that knows plenty of academics in, in Canada and the United States, are we overblowing this? Absolutely not. I mean, when it comes to issues like political matters, uh, how people make pronouncements about a given religion or they or not, there is app, everybody walks the exact same beat. Uh, again, I could just use, for example, anecdotal evidence, or, or I could cite actual studies, but let's go with anecdotal evidence. And I think I might have mentioned this before on the show. If you just go to my personal Facebook page, 
you will never see anyone. And I've got hundreds of academic friends on my personal Facebook page. Not a single person has ever uttered a position regarding, say, Trump that I would construe as surprising. Surprising in the sense that they might say something that is positive of him or favorable mm -hmm. or why someone might have voted for him. Every single academic friend that I have apes the identical same position. And that's simply not possible, right? Within any group of people, you would expect some diversity of thinking. Well, apparently there isn't. All right, so let's talk about Trump a little bit. Now, <laughs> I want to be clear that right now as we tape this, I am about to go off the grid for a month. So this is going up about 12 or 13 days after we're taping this. So in the way that we live these days, Trump could have done anything by then. The impeachment proceedings could have been begun. The, the monarchy could have started. Who the hell knows what's going to happen? But as we tape this on, what's today, July 28th, right. uh, 2017, um, I think you've been basically pretty fair on Trump. Uh, I don't sense that you love the guy, no. but I don't sense that you're have a deranged hatred of the guy. Right. Is that a fair estimation, Gad? That's exactly right. And usually when I've come out, quote, in support of Trump, that's not usually what I've done. Instead, I have offered very uh, reasonable psychological reasons why someone might vote for Trump. And so uh, I, uh, you, you may remember this in one of my conversations, I think it was with Sam Harris, where I explained the actual decision rule that someone might use in arriving at a decision to, to vote for Trump. Uh, and I'll just repeat it very yeah, quickly please. here. <clears throat> so when you're, when you're choosing between two multi-attribute products, two cars, two people to hire, uh, two mates to marry, uh, they're each defined by many attributes. So there are many decision rules that I could use in deciding whether to choose alternative A or alternative B. One of these decision rules is called the lexicographic rule, which basically says, take your most important attribute to you and choose the alternative that scores higher on that most important attribute. That's the only thing you look at. Mm -hmm. So in the case of applying that rule to Trump, if let's say my most important attribute, my lexicographic rule, uh, attribute is immigration, and rightly or wrongly, I view that Trump scores better on immigration, and if I use that rule, mm -hmm. I will choose Trump. Even though if I had looked at all of the attributes defining Trump and Clinton, I might have ended up choosing Clinton. Mm -hmm. So as someone who studies psychology and decision making, there were very, very clear cognitive processes that we could use to explain why a very reasonable person might end up choosing Trump. Now that doesn't mean that I, as I jokingly say on Twitter, that I have posters of Trump in my bedroom. <laughs> it simply means that as someone who is dispassionate, who is studying it from my Canadian context as a behavioral decision theorist, I could understand understand why people would vote for Trump. Just uttering that, the amount of hate that you get and the amount of you know, ostracizing that happens within academia because you dare say something that seems to support Trump, I mean, it's craziness. How much of that do you think is sort of the elitism of academia? In other words, you're saying something that's, that you're using your, the discipline that you have to, right. to give this idea of why people may have voted for Trump. So you're separating sort of the, the gad human part. You're saying, this is, this is what I think is happening based on information that I have, versus other academics that because they want to go to all the parties with the academics and all of that stuff, that Trump is, is sort of the reverse academic. Absolutely. So the idea that they could say anything nice about the person who's the reverse, who speaks in such ridiculous speech patterns and says so many over the top things and tweets like a madman, that somehow that would all be thrust upon them. Right, the, the way that I would frame exactly what you said is the elitist, the academics, the ivory tower folks, <clears throat> excuse me, they view Trump as a, f a fatal attack on their sense of aesthetics. It's, he is the, an injury to their aesthetics, right? The way he speaks, the way he enunciates, the way he shakes hands. Everything about him is an affront to their haughtiness. And therefore, there is this visceral hate of him at an aesthetic level. He's grotesque, he's an ogre, he's a buffoon. And I see this, this position enunciated amongst some of our common friends, yeah. where I typically would consider those friends to be, those common friends to be very sophisticated, dispassionate thinkers, but they've succumbed to that trap, where they are simply unable to stomach the possibility that this person could be sitting in the highest office. I think it really is that simple. They despise his sense of aesthetics. So I sense that your position on him is sort of where mine is in that 
forgetting what I think about him personally, and again, I, I could say the phrase moral center every time I bring him up. Again, don't know what his moral center is. I'm still confused as whether he's waking up every day and making all the decisions as they come on the fly or if there's a grand plan here or any of that. But the part that I like is the part that the media has taken it on the chin and basically been blown apart. And that, I think, is what we needed in this country. Um, I sense you're kind of with me on that. Absolutely. Look, uh, to use a cliche that I don't particularly like from sort of the buzzwords of business, he is a disruptor, right? To the extent that you wanted someone. <laughs> it's funny because they, they all love disruptors, but now they, but again, now every now and again, you're going to get a disruptor exactly. you don't like, right? And, I mean, he's a disruptor in every possible way that you could conceive of that term, right? He's from outside the political class. He's never held political office. He speaks differently from them. He's a brawler. He's a real estate guy. His, 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 his language pattern is that of a thug in grade eight. Uh, he is somewhat buffoonish. So in every possible way that we could think of what they aspire to, you know, as Barack Obama, he's the anti-Barack Obama. Barack Obama is sophisticated, he's majestic, he's a great orator, right? But again, those are superficial cues, right? Typically when we, when, he, when we look at psychology of persuasion, we look at substantive cues or cosmetic cues, right? How tall you are is something that people use when they judge your leadership qualities, but if objectively it shouldn't matter, correct? Right. And so in a similar manner, the fact that he might speak in a way that is clearly much more buffoonish than say Barack Obama, doesn't necessarily speak to whether you appreciate his policies or not. Yeah, and that's the part that I think is interesting, because again, as I said, we're, we're taping this about two weeks before it's gonna air, so who the hell knows what's gonna happen. But even just in the last couple of days, there was this thing with uh, with Scarmucci yes. and all the, the recording and you know Bannon wants to suck his own cock and blah, blah, yes. blah, all this stuff. And everyone's freaking out. I'm looking at Twitter and all the journalists, all the lefties, everyone's freaking out over the language and how can they talk like this. And all I was thinking was, yeah, I mean, I guess in some perfect world that we don't exist, I wish that government officials would be a little more professional. But the idea that Obama people and Bush before that and Clinton before that, and you can go back forever, literally go back right. to George Washington, the idea that they didn't speak it, it, with blue language and say nasty things about each other and, and all of that stuff and the infighting and backstab, the idea that this has just appeared now, it's just, it's, it's just, full outrage, it, right? Yeah, it's just fake. It's full outrage. Again, it's trying to maintain the facade of the ivory tower, right? This highfalutin way of baloney. I mean, wasn't it Nixon who, when you look at his his transcripts, every second word is <laughs> F this yeah. and F that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, these guys are not uh, Oxford professors of philosophy. And by the way, uh, I wouldn't want them to be. I want them to be human. That That's also the irony. It's like when Bill Clinton said, I don't inhale, it was like, you could admit you inhale. Or when Barack right. Obama, I guess, did say he inhaled, but right. it was like, the idea that we have to feel guilty about all of these things, like, we're all humans. We curse, some of us drink or smoke pot or do some other right. shit. And, and just to, to mention a couple of other qualities that I think uh, Trump does have, uh, you know, when you face a lot of conflicts, there, there's some research, I don't remember who it's by, I think it's made by Greg Murray at Texas Tech, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he looked at what, what types of leaders do people wish to elect as a function of the environment. Is there, for example, war or not? And so our preference for a particular type of leadership style changes as a function of the environment, as you would expect. Well, to the extent that we now face a lot of chaos with terrorism, with the immigration problems and so on, I would have predicted that someone like Trump, a guy who appears to be a bit reckless, who appears to be as though, am I gonna press the red button? Am I not going to press it? Even though he's not going, but the fact that he, he exudes those types of signals, I think to a lot of people that is a quality because you have very dangerous guys in the neighborhood who might feel intimidated by someone who appears to be a risk taker, who appears to be a brawler. And so in that sense, Here's another psychological reason why a lot of people might have latched onto him. So it also goes to show why when Obama or Hillary wouldn't say radical Islamic right. terror or whatever phrase that you wanted to say, uh, and Trump would just say anything, it sh Trump was just giving them the red meat. They were going, give me something. Give me exactly. something that makes sense. Then Trump says something that's probably over the top, right. but they're going, well, at least it's something. Exactly right. Uh, I should mention, I know that we both tentatively agreed not to talk much about Islam before the show, yeah. but let me just mention one or two things. Yeah. Uh, I think it is a misnomer to constantly come up with qualifiers before the word Islam. And let me explain why that is. There is no Islam, there is no Islamism. Islamism is part of Islam. Islam is a set of codified ideas 
that has a spiritual element and it has a political element. That political element is Islamism. The manner in which now people are talking about Islamism is it's, it's, it's something that is outside of Islam. And I understand the reason why people want to do this. It's because they feel as though it's too gauche to frontally attack a religion. So if you attack something that has magically ISM at the end of it, Islamism, that's okay. If you attack Islam, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. But the reality is if we're truly going to have a serious and honest conversation about this topic, we have to recognize that it's not radical Islam, it's not Islamism, it's not militant, violent extremism, and, <clears throat> and every other permutation of a euphemism that you come up with, it's Islam. Now, most people choose to practice a cafeteria version of Islam. They pick the parts that they like mm -hmm. and they ignore the endless parts that they don't like and that becomes their personal relationship with Islam. Yeah. That doesn't mean... That, but most people do that with most religions, right? Most people do that with most religions, but yeah. we don't, you and I and everybody else don't stay up worrying about Seventh-day Adventists. So right. to the extent that Islam is now on the radar and we have to talk about it honestly, we have to stop trying to give a free pass to Islam, but the real problem is something else, some variant of it. Okay? Yeah. Islam is codified in the Quran, it's codified in the Hadith, it's codified in the Sirah, the biography of Muhammad. That's it. Now, is there a way that I could read those texts and come up with a message of brotherly love and love for Jews? No. <laughs> that's not Islamism, that's not radical Islam, that's Islam. Now, as I say this, I also recognize that 95% of all uh, Muslims are just as nice as anybody that you could hope to have. That's not because they practice a gentle version of Islam codified in some other set of texts. That's because they're decent human beings who decide to, like the rest of us, pick and choose which parts apply to their daily lives and not. So we have to be very careful and honest about And I, I hope that at some point soon, a greater number of our common friends will actually heed what I'm saying now. Yeah, by the way, for the record, because you just mentioned that we said we weren't gonna talk about that much about Islam. It's not because we're afraid. I think we both, oh, yes. we both talked about it plenty of times, but we realized that we wanted to get more into some science stuff exactly and right. plenty of other stuff. Exactly. So I just, want, I just want to be clear, because otherwise people go, why didn't they, you see, they're, they're afraid now. <laughs> um, all right, so very quickly on that though, so you are writing a new book right now, which, yes. which deals with this and deals with ostrich parasitic syndrome. Yes. Uh, so very quickly for those that don't yes. know what OP Yes, is. Let's talk about that, and then I want to talk about the book, and then we'll move. Sure, to sure. Th thanks for asking. Uh, so let me sort of step back and give some some analogies. So if you look in the animal kingdom, there are many cases where you have brain worms or pathogens that enter the brain of a particular species, and it renders that sp species zombified. Okay. So example, uh, a mouse can be infected by a particular pathogen. Uh, it loses its innate fear of cats. That's not a good thing if you're a mouse, right? <laughs> right. Uh, there's another type of brain worm that uh, attacks the brains of ungulates, let's say moose or elk or deer, and they become, they become completely zombified where they just circle in the, same, in the same spot until these looming predators come and eat them, hmm. right? Uh, think of another example, uh, uh, someone who suffers from anorexia nervosa, right? They, their thinking now has become so disordered that even though they only weigh 70 pounds, they look at themselves in the mirror, and they genuinely think that they, are, they, they remain grotesquely obese and they need to lose a bit more weight, right? So there are all sorts of ways, there are so, so, all sorts of analogies where, uh, whether it be in the human context or with other species, where our brain become hijacked by either disordered thinking or literally a pathogen. So I took these ideas and I argued, well, what could explain the collective psychosis, the collective departure from reason that we see being exhibited uh, in the West? Not only as relating to, uh, to Islam, but as relating, for example, to the negation of the idea that humans are biological beings, that there are sex differences, that there are male. So this ostrich parasitic syndrome is not only applicable to Islam. And so that's how I came up with that term, to, to, to use the metaphor of the ostrich that buries its head, even though it doesn't truly do that, but it's an apt metaphor of yeah. denial of reality. Uh, re reality. Parasitic in that it genuinely parasitizes your brain and you lose your ability to think. Now, I specifically apply it to Islam because typically the ostriches that succumb to OPS come engage in all sorts of cognitive distortions to protect Islam, right? Yeah. Uh, Which ironically, you're talking about people that are not Muslim for the most part, not, right? Absolutely, yeah. so, so, so many of the OPS sufferers will end up being non-Muslims who, because they've been parasitized by OPS, will come up with all sorts of disordered thinking to defend Islam, right? And I give many, many of such examples. Uh, 
Now, I take this idea and it's part of my book. So the book is tentatively titled Death of the West by a Thousand Cuts. This is the idea that we, we are currently facing this OPS uh, epidemic because of a perfect confluence of faux intellectual movements that have parasitized our brains. So it's not one thing. It's radical feminism. It's identity politics. It's cultural and moral relativism. It's postmodernism, each of which uses its own machinery to parasitize our brain mm. to move away from reason. Right? I reject the idea that there's male and female. Well, evolutionary biologists and evolutionary psychologists don't, right? Yeah. I reject that there are innate sex differences. Well, the average three-year-old knows that there is such a thing. I reject that there is any link between Islam and any terrorism. Islam is peace, right? So how did we lead to this? Well, we, we, led, we, we were led to this by 40, 50 years of these movements chipping away at our commitment to reason and hence death of the West by a thousand cuts. So what was the failure of the side of reason then for the last 40 or 50 years? What, what did the people that were reasonable, that were sensible and trying to deal with things honestly and, and see the world as it is, not how they wanted it to be, where, where did they fail? Well, I, so if I say, if I speak in the academic ecosystem, I think the fact that we tolerated these, these affront to human decency and human reason, like postmodernism to exist. Mm -hmm. It really came from a place of, you know, we have to tolerate, in this case, the intolerable. The intolerable in that n nothing could be further from being anti-scientific than postmodernism. What does postmodernism say? There are no objective truths, other than, of course, the one truth that there are no <laughs> objectives, right? <laughs> right. So they miss Other it. than the thing you really gotta believe. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so postmodernism and all of its endless faux pr profundity and, and, and you know, faux nonsense is really a direct attack on science, right? Science presumes that there are certain universal regularities that we're going to use a scientific method to try to better understand. Well, imagine if now a, a bunch of nihilists come along who say there is no such thing as truth, there is no such thing as objective truth. Uh, well, that chips away at the reason why we all exist in science to try to understand the world. But how would academia, academia fight that properly? If, if the ideas we have to battle, I, you know, I know we both believe in the battle of ideas, so if the, uh, if the idea here is that in colleges you're supposed to have these battles, I know you beat it with better ideas, but how, how would that have actually happened? Well, I think what, what probably ended up happening, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm surmising here, I'm not sure how, how it happened, but I'm guessing that most people are busy in their daily lives, right? The, for the same reasons why most people don't speak out against Islam, you know, let Dave Rubin worry about that. Let, let someone else worry He's about thrilled. that. He's <laughs> thrilled. Right. Uh, you know, I'm busy preparing for my daughter's graduation. I gotta pick up the tomatoes for my groceries today, right? And so people diffuse responsibility to others. So in a sense, there is a split within academia from the sciences, the natural and social sciences, by the way. It is wrong to presume that the social sciences are any less committed to the scientific method than the natural sciences, which is something that we could talk yeah, about. Yeah, I, I do wanna get to right. that, absolutely. Uh, people are busy, right? So the chemist sits in his lab and he sees that there's a bunch of humanities guys uttering, utter you know, gibberish. Right. Well, he's, he doesn't necessarily have the time and energy and proclivity to, to weigh in on it. And so somehow these guys found a little niche within the ecosystem called academia and they flourished and they multiplied and the cancer spread and metastasized. And now 40, 50 years later, you have generations of students who've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars being trained to be naturally lobotomized morons. Yeah, you know, it's so, the, the metaphor is perfect of this parasite that gets in there and keeps multiplying. And I can picture now the, the biology professor going, all right, I kind of see that, but it's not gonna affect me here, except now what we're seeing is it's starting to even creep right. into that. Have you seen this, uh, there's this great picture online of, uh, you know, somebody selling the shirt and it says there are no genders, <laughs> but you can only buy it in male or yeah, female, yes, yes. and it's like, you know, there you go. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about the natural sciences versus the social sciences. First, for the layman, what is the difference? They both have science in a gag, come on. <laughs> right, so, the lay, the lay person will often use these sort of simplifying heuristics to determine what is science versus not. If you're wearing a lab coat, if you have a petri <laughs> dish, right? If you have a couple of chemical formulas, that's science. Because to the average lay person, that's impenetrable. Uh, 
On the other hand, most people have, for example, a folk psychology. They have an innate sense of what psychology is. And therefore, to the extent that they feel that they could contribute, even though they might be lay people, somehow that's less impenetrable to them. Right. So they then will create this false dichotomy where chemistry and physics, that's real science, but sociology, you know, it's for people who couldn't hack it in, in, in physics. The reality is that the only difference is what are the phenomena that you're studying across these two general rubrics of science. In the social sciences, you're studying psychology, anthropology, uh, economics, sociology. It could be as rigorous as the natural sciences. So let me give you an example. If, you could, if you're a sociologist, you could study sociometry, which is, you know, for example, how does power diffuse within a network? And you could use very fancy mathematics, graph theory, to try to understand this. So the type of mathematical modeling that you would use to study how power diffuses within a network is actually a very uh, fancy mathematical approach. But sociology has somehow been co-opted by the activists, right? Yeah. And so we then view it as being less scientific. But sciences simply means adhering truthfully to the scientific method. I posit a hypothesis. I think about the data that I would need to collect that would either falsify or not a hypothesis. I collect that data. I apply some sort of uh, statistical analysis, some mathematical analysis to analyze the data, and then I go one way or the other. That could be just as applied if it's in economics or if it is in physics. So it is wrong, because I often get letters and emails from people asking me, well, is psychology really a science? I mean, of course it's a science. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, what is more laudable than studying the most important organism that we know called humans, right? Yeah. So, so it's not as though by the sheer nature of what physicists study, they are real scientists, but the sociologist is not. And by the way, I'm not trying to defend sociologists here because I often am the one who's criticizing sociologists. <laughs> but right. usually I'm criticizing them for deviating from the scientific method. What makes them less scientists is that they become activists and not scientists. But you could be just as much as a scientist if you study something in business or if you study something in chemistry. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk, say, talk about activists, not scientists, because that's what I've been saying about journalists. These people are not doing true journalism and fact-finding anymore and reporting nice based on evidence. What they're doing is letting their own biases, biases slam right into the middle exactly. of this thing. And so for, so one of the things that uh, I will say differentiates the, sci the natural sciences from the social sciences, and that's very much at the heart of the work that I do, the natural sciences have organized trees of knowledge. So in physics, people agree on a set of core knowledge that at this point has become unassailable. Notwithstanding the fact that they still have the epistemic humility to say, oh, if new provision, it's only provisional. If something now falsifies it, I'm willing to revise it. Right. But there is. But, but the bedrock. The bedrock is yeah. there. There is core knowledge that is now unassailable in physics, in chemistry. There aren't chemists who are for the periodic table <laughs> and chemists who are against it. Right, right, right. Therefore, you could build coherent trees of knowledge or the term that I love to use, which was reintroduced into the common lexicon by E.O. Wilson, the evolutionary biologist at Harvard, is consilience, unity of knowledge. So the natural sciences, by the, by the nature of how they test theories, have these organized trees of knowledge. That's what's lacking in the social sciences. And the reason it's lacking is not because the social sciences are any less scientific, it's because it is easier for ideologies to creep into the social sciences, right? So if I'm a libertarian or a Marxist, I might study economics in a way that is very polluted by my right. personal ideology. So it's not that the social sciences are epistemologically any inherently less scientific than chemistry. It's that biases are easier to creep in. Yeah, it's funny because I'll hear, and I talk to sometimes someone's a leftist economist or a libertarian economist or whatever it is, and I always think it's kind of funny, like we all have our own beliefs economically. I'm a little more libertarian these days, but if you're studying something within the window of the way you want it to be, it by default is gonna be a little screwy. Absolutely, and, and as I said, it, it is naturally more difficult for your personal ideological biases to come into uh, something that you're studying in organic chemistry. Although I should mention that there have been famous cases where even hard sciences have been deeply polluted by ideologies. So Lysenkoism, 
Lysenko was a, a, a Russian or Soviet Union uh, geneticist who proposed a theory of genetics that he thought was more in line with Marxist philosophy. That was a wrong theory of genetics that led to a massive famine uh, and to the death of millions of people. So even, it's not as though hard scientists are uh, inoculated from the possibility of being parasitized by some of these ideological biases. Do you think it's too late for the hard sciences to be protected? Like, is it too late for them to turn their force field on? Because we do see this creeping now in biology. I mean, Brett Weinstein's right. been talking about this now, that now it's really reaching its hand into that, it, which could have horrific repercussions for well, society. Well, listen, when, when, a, when a scientist in the 21st century, I'm speaking of myself right now, has to appear in front of the Canadian Senate <laughs> to argue that there's such a thing as male and female, yeah. and that evolution Evolutionary biology is based on the recognition that there is sexual dimorphism in human. Sexual dimorphism is a fancy term for saying basically that there are evolved sex differences. Humans, men, males are bigger than females, right? That's a sexual dimorphism. So the fact that I have to appear in front of the Canadian Senate to actually argue these things right. demonstrates how far the snake has gone into the, the den. Yeah, so in a weird way, your position as a evolutionary biologist is, a, is sort of right at the front of the type of person that this ideology would attack, right? Just to correct, I'm, I'm an evolution psychologist. Uh, psychologist, sorry. I, I apply no, evolutionary not biologist. biologist. I just said biologist, yeah. sorry. Although I apply evolutionary <laughs> biological principles. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's craziness, right? And, and, and the reason why I'm so, if you like, aware of the, the epistemological dichotomy between the natural and social sciences is because my scientific career of 20 plus years has really been straddling both these fields, right? I apply evolutionary biology to study consumer behavior. Consumer behavior would be construed as something within the social sciences. Evolutionary biology is something that is within the natural sciences. So I really am very much steeped in both cultures and I see the extent to which it is easier for people to succumb to their personal biases in the social sciences. Let me just give you one example. Yeah. Uh, if you start off with the premise that you can't agree on whether there is such a thing as innate sex differences or not, how could you from that starting point ever build a tree of knowledge that's organized? If at this most fundamental level we can't agree that there is such a thing as male or female, then we're done, we're cooked. Uh, physicists don't suffer from that problem, and that's why they make much better progress than, than social scientists do. So as someone that studies marketing and why we behave how we do, what turns us on, what turns us off, all of that, in a weird way, you were, you were prepared for everything that was gonna happen politically right now and what's happening on the academic front because all of these things, they're all marketing in a way. Trump, it's marketing. Hillary marketed herself in a, in a certain way. So the trends were all there. Life is happen. marketing. Yeah. So when people ask me, so what, what do you study as, as a professor of marketing? And I always answer them, everything yeah. you do in life is marketing. You market yourself on the mating market. We even use the euphemisms of the marketplace, right? You, yeah. you, you position yourself in the marketplace. You market yourself in the labor market. You market yourself to friends. You position yourself depending on whether you wish to belong to a group or not. Uh, animals communicate with each other, right? When, when animals advertise, for example, when the peacock, the peacock is literally engaging in conspicuous advertising. <laughs> so everything in life is marketing. So one of the reasons why I was very much interested in applying all of my training in marketing is because that's, I think, where all the sexy stuff is, right? We take all of these principles from psychology, from economics, from biology, uh, and then I apply them in areas that are of greatest import to most people. Is there something kind of scary about that, though, that it's not that the best ideas will necessarily win, it's that the best marketed ideas will win, and those often are not the same things? Very good point. Listen, I'm, I'm right now working on my next book, and I just connected with a uh, what appears to be a wonderful literary agent, and he actually made this exact point. He said, look, what's really important as we move forward with your book <laughs> is how to market it, yeah. because there'll be people who will be very resistant to the ideas that you propose in that book. So again, everything is marketing. So basically, if you want to, so did Trump, do you think, have, not to bring everything back to him, but he must have had, I guess, as a businessman and putting his name all over these things for the last 30 years, he had an innate understanding of exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. Well, listen, I could speak to one thing that he knew very well. He could completely read that many people, the silent majority, 
or certainly a sizable minority, if we're going to use the popular vote and all right, that, right. Uh, were fed up with political correctness and said, I'm going to be the anti-PC guy. And he bet pretty much everything on that, and it turns out that people responded to it, right? He could have equivocated, he could have been more careful with his words, but he sort of, he, he flies off the handle because he realized that the general atmosphere was most people, whether they're having chats on Facebook or at their workplace by the water cooler at the university, are tired of feeling stifled, are tired of feeling scared of the next syllable that they might misutter that might ruin their careers. And he said, I am the anti-PC warrior. And people responded to that marketing position. So as someone that studies all this stuff, what, what do you think he really drives people at the end of the day. You know, I, I mentioned before, as I say often, I think it's just a couple things. You wanna have a job, you wanna have some money, hopefully a house, maybe a family, maybe some sex, whatever. Just right. the, ba the basic stuff that yes. we all want. Do you think those are really just the, right. the underliers? So, so in, in several of my books, I actually answer that question in the following way. I map c consumption acts onto four key Darwinian modules. So think about how Maslow's hierarchy, mm -hmm. if, you, if you know it. Yep. So at the basic level, there's the physiological needs and then belonging, you know, safety needs, belongingness needs, all the way up to self-actualization. Well, his theory was really based on his humanistic uh, philosophy. In other words, he had this bias, this, this ideological bias of how humans should be. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily grounded in an understanding of biology. So I took this principle and I said, no, let's see what actually drives people based on biological principles. And so my four Darwinian modules are the survival module. So a lot of the things that we do are related to uh, our, our survival instincts. So our preference for fatty foods, right? Why is it that it's easy for us to succumb to uh, the dessert effect, having an extra piece of dessert when we've already had more calories than we need to? Well, that comes from the fact that our gustatory preferences have evolved in an environment of caloric scarcity and caloric uncertainty. So your taste buds and mine are vestiges of an environment long gone, but that we've evolved to have. But can your brain evolve to override that? Let me because, I'll answer yeah. that in a second. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's actually called the mismatch hypothesis. I'll come to it in a sec. Okay. So, so first we've got survival, then we've got uh, reproduction, everything related to sex. Why do men, why are 99% of Ferrari owners male? Because that's the form of peacocking. So the mm -hmm. peacock's tail is literally the Aston Martin that men drive, right? Yeah. And of course, both male, men and women engage in sexual signaling. So first we've got survival instinct, we've got uh, reproduction, then we've got kin selection. Kin selection is the mechanism that explains why is it that I would jump into the river to save three of my brothers? If all I care about is my survivability, why would I ever take the risk on them? Well, when you realize that, uh, natural selection operates at the, at the level of the gene, then saving three brothers, each of whom share half the genes with me, makes sense. Now you might say, well, how do you apply that in consumer behavior? Well, gift giving practices, right? So how I modulate the size of the gift that I give to different people turns out to be perfectly correlated to the genetic relatedness with each of these people. I give larger gifts to my brother than I do to my second cousin. I may not do this consciously. Mm -hmm. I may not know all these fancy theories when I'm doing it, but our brains have evolved to recognize that people are not of equal genetic relatedness. And the fourth module is reciprocal altruism. Okay, I jump into the river to save three brothers, but why would I jump in to save Dave Rubin? He's not my brother. Well, that comes from this evolved idea of tit for tat. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Well, today I might jump to save you with the expectation that tomorrow when I'm drowning, hopefully you'll come and save me. So this idea of reciprocity has evolved for social species. And again, it explains why I will invite you out for dinner when it's your birthday and you will hopefully reciprocate when it's mine. From a strict economic perspective, there's no point to this, right? Let's not invite each other, we'll be at the same final position. The reason why we do this exchange is to oil our friendship and our bond. Mm -hmm. So I argue that much of consumer behavior could be mapped onto these four modules. So now to your other question. Yeah. Uh, no, it is very difficult for our brain to catch up to a current reality. So for example, men have evolved sex sexual territoriality as a, as, a, as a strong element of their psychology, right? They don't like women to be uh, promiscuous if they're with them. Mm -hmm. they, get, they get sexually uh, uh, jealous if another man touches their woman and so on. Well, why would that have evolved? That goes both ways, right? It, from from uh, men and women? Interestingly, okay, so let's okay. do another premise. <laughs> interestingly, yeah, this, is right, not we'll, my, yeah. this is not my work, this is David Buss's work, a, a, a colleague, evolutionary psychologist at University of Texas, Austin. He looked at, with some of his colleagues, at 
romantic infidelity versus sexual infidelity. So he brought in people to the lab. He, he set them up with all sorts of physiological measures to measure their stress and had them read one of two vignettes. Uh, your, your husband right now is uh, having sex with the gorgeous secretary versus uh, your husband is developing an emotional bond with his co-worker. She laughs at his jokes. They, they get along. So in one case, mm -hmm. you trigger sexual infidelity and the other one, romantic infidelity. Well, it turns out that women respond much more uh, adversely to romantic infidelity than to sexual infidelity, and that effect is reversed for men. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that women appreciate sexual infidelity <laughs> right. or are tolerant of it, but it's less so. Now, what are the reasons for it? Well, it turns out that sexual infidelity is a profoundly important evolutionary problem for men because we're a biparental species where males invest a lot in their children. It doesn't make a lot of sense for me to invest for many, many years until little Johnny grows up to be sexually mature to then find out that it was the sexy Greek or Roman gardener who sired that guy, right? <laughs> Therefore, I evolved this, the, the psychological apparatus to try to protect against this possibility. So I am very intolerant of sexual infidelity. If a woman cheats on a man, it almost guarantees the end of the solution. The other way around, it doesn't. On the other hand, what's the greatest threat to a woman's interests? It's not that he has a sexual dalliance one time. This is why men very naively often will say, I just had sex with her once, she meant nothing to me. Right. They actually think that this is helping yeah. because there is no emotional bond between us. It's a one-time thing, right? On the other hand, if a man develops a emotional tie with a woman, that's a much greater predictor of him leaving the relationship. And that's why women respond so adversely to emotional infidelity. But if a man says, well, it was just a one-time thing, isn't he then, let's assume it's the truth for a second, a guy yeah. does it one time, he's telling the woman what she wants to hear, right? I mean, what, what, if it's true for him, it's also what she does want to hear because she doesn't want to hear, well, it's oh, absolutely. It, it's certainly much better for him to yeah. say it was a one-time thing rather than I think I'm falling for her and we're planning on having sex another 37 times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he genuinely, honestly is trying to convey to her that she literally meant nothing to him. He's perfectly able to decouple the sexual act from any emotional investment, right? He, when you think about when Johns who go see prostitutes, what do they typically tell you? It's perfectly unencumbered sex. Mm -hmm. I'm able to have sex with her and walk away. I pay for that walking away, right? So again, that speaks to evolved sex differences. This whole conversation that we've had might be transphobic systemic violence <laughs> under Bill C-16 because look, I didn't talk about the non-gender or non-binary. Yeah. I what? must be a genocide supporter. <laughs> Naturally. Okay. Uh, but I'm glad you just mentioned that yeah. because as you're saying this, I'm not even exactly sure what my question is, but is there an element uh, as you're sitting across from a gay person that enters some of this Great stuff? question. Uh, I don't think we finished the mismatch question. Yeah, oh, okay, wait, yeah. let's get to that. Let, then. let me finish yeah. that, then we'll, we'll talk about homosexuality. You're giving me a lot here, so I, well, it's, that's, uh, yeah. that's why I wanted to do the science. That's why we're here. Yeah, beautiful, thank you. Uh, so it, our brains don't catch up as quickly as we otherwise would want. So for example, the fact that, look, the top killers, the top medical killers, colon cancer, heart disease, diabetes, from an evolutionary medicine perspective, the argument is that it stems from the fact that today we live in an environment of plenty, mm -hmm. but our gustatory preferences have evolved in an environment of caloric scarcity and uncertainty. That mismatch between our current environment of plenty and the environment in which we've evolved causes some of these top killers. So to answer your question in a long-winded way, no, our brains don't catch up. If there were selection pressures for the next X number of years to cause an evolutionary trajectory to change, then it would happen. But typically, for even the most basic genetic uh, selection, it might take, say, 5,000 years. Right. So I guess what I'm talking about then is for the person that never goes for the dessert or never right. binges on this or that. That's not an evolutionary thing as much as it's someone that's aware, uh, it's, it's someone that's educated and aware of that these things can cause health problems. And you might be, like I live here in LA where everyone doesn't eat this or right. that or doesn't want gluten. Everyone's, everyone has celiac disease, which <laughs> no one has celiac disease. Right. I mean, so that's not evolution. That's just sort of doing something different with the information you have, right? It's not on the macro level an evolutionary thing. Well, and sometimes 
you have multiple Darwinian pulls pulling you in different directions so that the net effect is zero. So for example, when I explain why there are evolutionary pressures for both men and women to cheat on their long-term partners, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that it's a fatalistic argument. It's not biological determinism. We're doomed to cheat because we also have evolved the moral calculus, right? Our morality, unless you're a religious person that thinks that it comes from God, our morality has also evolved through the exact same evolutionary forces that explain why we have opposable thumbs. And so, on the one hand, I'd like to very much cheat on my wife. On the other hand, I've got this moral calculus that stops me from doing. The net effect is that I might actually not do it. So, this speaks to a really important point, which is the fact that you explain something from an evolutionary perspective doesn't mean that it is biologically fatalistic. Got it. All right. So uh, Homosexuality. Yes. Now, if we add that into this mix that you're talking about here. So the, the top theory that has been proposed that has not, the data has not cooperated, comes from actually kin selection. So let me explain. It's a bit technical. Yeah. So, uh, you could increase your fitness. In other words, you could, you could extend your genes through direct reproduction. That's called direct fitness, right? If I have children, I'm extending my genes. But I could also, if you like, increase my inclusive fitness by investing in those who are related to me. When I, when I invest in my nephews, I am indirectly extending my genes, correct? Mm -hmm. So the argument then is that uh, Homosexuality need not be a Darwinian cul-de-sac, meaning a Darwinian dead end, because even though you may decide to not have children, by investing in your kin, you could still be extending your genes. Now, mm -hmm. how would you test this idea? Well, you would take, for example, homosexual uncles and heterosexual uncles and see if the homosexual uncles invest more in their nephews and nieces. And if the answer would be yes, then that would be one data point that supports the idea. I have taught my nephew everything I know about <laughs> Star Wars, and I am very so that proud. supports this kid the theory. Knows everything, you know? right? So, yeah. But the data has not supported that. So the bottom line is the top argument, the top evolution. Wait, the data has not supported, has not supported that, that. that that actually happened. Exactly. In other really? words, the kins. The kin selection based argument for homosexuality, while at the theoretical level, conceptually speaking, it so yeah. sounds good, yeah. the data has not supported that. Uh, so that's as far as I know about the nexus between homosexuality and evolution. Although I think we might have mentioned this when you came on my show, I do have a current doctoral student who is actually planning on studying in his doctoral dis dissertation the intersection between, now get ready for this, homosexuality evolutionary psychology and consumer behavior. Now, how is that gonna work? So we're going to look at phenomena that typically happen between men and women. Mm -hmm. and for example, if you go out on a first date, uh, the best way to never have a second date in the heterosexual context is for a man to be cheap on a first date. Right. That guarantee, and, and even if the woman is a billionaire, if he exhibits cues of frugality, it's dead, Yeah. okay? So then let's take this idea and see whether within the context of the dynamics of homosexual relationships, when, a, when two men go out on a date for the first time, mm -hmm. could we see a replication of this phenomenon? But now there isn't male, female here, so what would be the proxy measure, top, bottom? Yeah. So could, for example, your sex role as either a predominantly top or a predominantly bottom replicate the sex differences that we typically see at the interactions between men and women? What do, you, right. what do you think of that, by the way? Well, I don't know. It's so interesting because I don't know that your sexual position has anything to do with how you necessarily on a date would say I'm going to pay or not pay. I don't. I, I get. I get this. You're saying that basically the the, the top, top is is, is, is mimicking of, the, the the masculine. The, yeah, right. Exactly. I, I get. I mean, I guess at some. If, uh, that's what I would have guessed if right, you not said right. that. But I don't know that there's. So any we're going there. to test some. Uh, yeah. Let's take another example of exactly this idea. Uh, so when when men and women mate there's what's called assortative mating. So birds of a feather flock together. So typically women, it's not that women want necessarily tall guys, it's that they want a taller guy. Mm -hmm. So you just it's very rare for a woman to date someone shorter than her. So there's actually a study that was done with 720 naturally occurring couples. Only one of the 720 was the woman taller than the man. Right? Really? Yeah, it's a quite ex extraordinary rare. So. Let, now let's apply that to almost, now I haven't done the research, but here's my hypothesis. Yeah. I bet that the top bottom distinction will determine the height thing. In other words, if the, the bottom guy will be in a long-term union 
in a, not a meeting in the in the gay sauna for <laughs> quick sex, <laughs> gotcha. but but a long term pairing, a, a ma you know, a marriage. Uh, he'll be the shorter guy. So a lot of the phenomena that we would pick up from evolutionary psychology as applied to heterosexual context will replicate in the homosexual context. So I'm curious, all this being said, and as you said, you're, you're hypothesizing yes. about some of this stuff, and, and obviously your, your, <laughs> your student's gonna work on some of this, and other right. people are gonna work on some of this. Is there a complication that links everything else we've been talking about, where if you talk about gay anything, that this could get you in some sort of trouble? I, I don't sense you feel that as you're talking about it, but uh, that there would be some piece of this that you might find something that would lead you to somewhere uncomfortable or something. In the context of academia? Yeah, I don't mean you personally uh, right. uncomfortable, well, but I'm... I actually think that if you do any research right now on any of the LGBTQ things, that would be a very good thing because you would be somehow labeled as a progressive. Mm -hmm. So in the context of the ecosystem... Unless that you came to a conclusion that Oh, the conclusion want. that was not politically correct. Yeah. Yes. So that speaks to actually an issue that I've discussed with several folks, and I think perhaps maybe Sam Harris mentioned it when he had me on his show. He was asking me, is there any research that yeah. you would consider? And I to wanted be... to ask you this very same okay. question. Okay. Uh, so maybe we can get into that. Uh, and and the, the term that I had used with him then, which came from a paper that was published in Nature, forbidden knowledge. No, I am a strong non-proponent of the idea of forbidden knowledge. If research is done honestly, uh, assiduously, with a full adherence to the scientific method, then there is no question that is too taboo to, to ask. That actually speaks to something in philosophy, the difference between deontological ethics and consequentialist ethics. Deontological ethics is the following. It is never okay to lie. That's a deontological statement. A consequentialist ethics statement would say, well, it might be okay to lie depending on the consequences of the lie, right? right? If it's gonna cause 20 people to die. Exactly. So one is an absolutist perspective, one is it's a situational, it depends on the consequences. So I will use that framework to answer the, the forbidden taboo question of what kind of research is okay or not. Yeah. Uh, if you are a purist, a deontological epistemological person, I do research wherever it takes me, then you don't care about the consequences. If you are consequentialist bent, then you say, well, but if we do race differences and the results come out in a way that it could be used to harm a racial group, then we should stay away from it. I actually think that that's a profoundly dangerous position to take mm -hmm. because it's precisely this type of argument that led the social sciences to reject biology as being important. The, the, the early anthropologists, cultural anthropologists, who said biology doesn't matter for humans, were coming from an honorable place because they saw how Cretans could misuse biology, right? The Nazis can say, hey, there's a battle between the races, uh, it's a Darwinian struggle, we're Aryan, we won, who cares, uh -huh. let, let the Jews die. Uh, the British social class elitists said there's a battle between the social classes, the lower classes lost, screw them, it's a Darwinian struggle. Of course, this has nothing to do with Darwin, but because these folks misappropriate, misappropriated biological thinking, then the cultural anthropologists came along and said, let's get rid of biology uh -huh. because then nobody could misuse it. And now we're in the quagmire where we are today, where we have to appear in front of the Canadian Senate to argue that there is such a thing as male or female. So no, if you are a purist, you pursue knowledge wherever it takes you, unencumbered by the consequences. Is the problem that I suppose a certain amount of people, scientists included, probably think that they're purists, but actually aren't? You know what I mean? Like, so, so Mengele probably thought that, you know, who was doing all sorts of- You evil. went all Nazi on Yeah, me, right? I, I went Nazi on, <laughs> In this particular case, I feel a Nazi reference is actually, okay, is, is actually sensible as okay. opposed to Nazi references that are thrown around right. all day long. But, but if, if you think about that, I mean, Mengele was doing horrific experiments on, on twins and just all sorts of things that were considered uh, b beyond imagination, horrible. Mm -hmm. Um, probably believed that he was doing it for the good of truth and the good of science and all that. I don't, you know what I mean? Yes, like, sure. For, so he may have been a horrific person. I don't think he, in his heart, he probably thought he was doing good though, which right. is. So the only thing that I would say that would stop that from happening now is that we do have institutional review boards or ethics boards now that ensure that there is a boundary on the scientific pursuits that you could, well, pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And that is, you know, you can't frivolously harm animals. The way you treat them in the lab is important. You can't frivolously harm both physically and or psychologically human subjects, right? But interestingly though, now they've gone overboard. So the, the institutional review boards now have become so aware to want to be the antithesis of Mengele so that now if I ask you, what is your sex? <laughs> right, so that could be traumatizing. If I ask you, what is your income? Well, wait, in some cultures, that's an affront and that could send the person into a tailspin of suicide because I asked him what his income is. And so now the most banal, innocuous questions have to be discussed for 73,000 years in these institutional review boards. So I think the fulcrum now swung too far the other way so that it is now stopping good science from being done because we are so afraid of harming any third party. Right. So the good intention of we actually don't want to harm this animal or we don't want to inject a dye into a human's eye that might blind them has become now we don't want to offend this person. Exactly right. This is a huge jump that's dangerous for science. Absolutely, and, and, and frankly, I see the fear in my graduate students when they're about to apply for uh, a thesis grant because they've heard all these horror stories and they come to me and say, Professor Saad, how long is the process going to take? <laughs> and I always answer them, it really depends on the makeup of the folks that are going to review your application. If they are perfectly reasonable people, it might go through in, in, in a session. If they are absolute maniacs, it might take us three months of rewriting this damn thing for some guy to finally accept that, you know, we're not injecting dye in people's face. And the reality is most of the research that I get involved in, although it's you know very rigorous and scientific, really has no downstream harm that's going to be caused. But it's unbelievable the types of concerns that people raise, and and we need to rail that, uh, rein that in a bit. Yeah, uh, I want to talk a little bit about robotics, which I've never even okay. mentioned the phrase robot to you or <laughs> any of that stuff. But there is something about we're we're getting into this time with incredible automation, and we know about you know cars that are driving themselves, and we know that uh, you know people iPads are going to put McDonald's employees out of business, and all of this stuff. How will that affect the way? we evolve, how do, like now that we're gonna add this thing that is completely artificial and outside of us, right. is there an evolutionary piece to that? Or is that something else altogether? No, I think so, it's something, because for evolution to, to work, right, there, there has to be a selection environment that is, if, if I'm bored, let, let me, for, for, for your viewers who may not know how evolution works, let yeah. me explain it in, in three seconds, okay? Let, uh, you, uh, a male and a female get together, through sexual reproduction, they have an offspring. This random combination and shuffling of genes results in their offspring having a blue dot here. If that blue dot is heritable, it could be passed on. And if that blue dot confers a survival advantage to the animal, then the selection pressures are in place for eventually that blue dot to become part of the makeup of that species. So to answer your question, you would have to explain to me how there are specific selection pressures that affect the survivability of an organism or its reproductive viability for me to be able to offer an evolutionary argument. Right now, I can't think yeah. of one. Does that make Fair sense? Enough. That that does make sense. Okay. I feel I can't end this on a question that we would say doesn't make sense perfectly, so <laughs> I will ask you this. Okay. And we're gonna do this many more times. You'll do this again? Anytime I'm here. All right. Um, Taking everything that we've discussed here, are you hopeful or not for the future of the West? Do you think we are just caught in sort of this leftist postmodernist stuff versus uh, a nationalism or a populism that could be dangerous? Or do you think that the enlightenment values that you care about and liberalism and all that actually has a chance to turn this stuff around? So here's now where I need to put on my marketing hat on. Yeah. Uh, as an Sell it, brother. Exactly. Sell if, it. If I'm going to speak about some of the times when I see the tsunami of ostrich thinking that comes my way, then I feel very pessimistic. I feel as though an utter disaster has to happen before people wake up. On the other hand, because I'd like to peddle hope and market hope, I think that it doesn't take too much to redress the ship. If enough silent people, silent voices rise up in every ecosystem, on Facebook, on the, in the media, in academia, at the bar, and actually the, you know, trigger the courage that is necessary for them to weigh in, I think that the voices, the enemies of reason will become marginalized. But we need to rise up 
And that's why I always tell people when they ask me, well, what can I do? I say, well, you don't have to have the voice of Dave Rubin or the platform of Dave Rubin. You just have to have enough courage to take on your friends when you're engaging them on Facebook. When your professor says something that seems like it's an affront to reason, challenge him or her. Don't be silent. So I think that if enough people do that, then the ship can be redressed. If we remain apathetic, then I think we will lose. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And as I always say, I'm one guy that started a channel on YouTube. <laughs> You're one guy who started a channel on YouTube. We came from very different places. Yeah. And, and if our voices have done a little something, then there's plenty of other people that can Amen. replicate Amen, that brother. as well. All right, I think you guys know where his channel is, but if not, check out Gad's YouTube channel uh, at youtube.com slash gadsad.